Uh, very good afternoon to everyone, partners, friends, and uh, everyone for making the time to join us today. So thank you and welcome to the Wild Digital Online Series, Episode 8. And uh, today's session is going to be all about streaming. So we're going to talk a bit about uh, you know, online streaming, content streaming, uh, shopping, you know, those kind of stuff. Um, it's a sector that I think is very fast growing. There's a lot of interesting trends and insights uh, coming out of this space now. And Southeast Asia, you know, is very uniquely positioned for this entire sector. So my name is Mohan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of E27. Uh, I'm very glad and excited to be able to moderate this session today. Um, we have two panelists uh, joining us, uh, Dinesh and uh, Albert. Uh, Dinesh is with um, a company called uh, IGE International. And uh, Albert is uh, with a company called uh, Burda Principal Investments. We were supposed to have a uh, shitage. Uh, join us from Mind Valley Quest, but unfortunately, due to a, a family-related issue, he, he, he couldn't make it. So let's uh, jump straight into the panelists first. Uh, maybe, uh, Dinesh, why don't you just uh, give a quick introduction about yourself? Sure, thanks, Mohan. Hi, everyone who's uh, dialing in today, today afternoon. Uh, so I work for Aichi International. We are, we are a leading player in the online entertainment industry. We're headquartered in Beijing, China. We've been with the number one player in the domestic Chinese market since 2015, where we've got more than 600 uh, monthly devices logging into our platform. Uh, we've been around for 10 years, uh, playing a big role in the Chinese tech and media ecosystem. And uh, since mid 2019, we've started our international expansion. So we're still early days in, in sort of expanding outside of China. Uh, so exciting times ahead. And I recently joined about two months ago uh, to lead their efforts in Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei. And uh, previously, you were with uh, iFlix, right, Dinesh? That's right. Previously, I was with iFlix, and before that, we catch us. So I've been in the in the Southeast Asian tech team for a little bit. Nice. Well, really good to have you. Uh, uh, and uh, Albert? Yeah, thanks, Mohan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me on the show as well. Uh, my name's Albert. I, I lead our uh, investment activities in Southeast Asia for further principal investments. We are the growth capital arm of a European media and technology company called Hubert Herda Media. And we've been investing into tech companies in uh, Southeast Asia for the past four years now. Some of our portfolio companies include uh, Zilingo, Carsum, Hamlet, and uh, Sashaway. So mostly we invest into series B stage companies um, with a consumer leaning slant to them. So really happy to be here today. Great. Um, so just some uh, quick uh, uh, announcements, right? Uh, if you get disconnected throughout the session, just log back uh, right in using the same link uh, that you previously received. Uh, and uh, also throughout the sessions, right? Uh, most of you are, all of you are on mute, except of course for the panelists and myself. So feel free to ask questions in the question box. I hope to take the questions throughout the session, not just right at the end. So if the panelists have said something interesting that you want to have a follow-up question on, you know, shoot it over to me uh, uh, ASAP, and then I will I will jump into it. Um, if you want, you can even raise your hand, and you can potentially unmute yourself and even ask a question. Uh, so let's keep this uh, engaging, uh, and I and I hope that we can all learn from this together. So let's jump straight in. Yeah, my my first question, right, is actually to Albert. Um, so you've definitely, as you know, as a VC, seen you know a lot of interesting pictures about the uh, space, right? I'm sure streaming has been a space where you've gotten an increasing amount of pictures over the years. Could you share with us maybe some interesting ideas that you've seen, some interesting companies that have come across your way and how they are potentially disrupt, uh, disrupting some of the existing sectors? Sure. So, yeah, I know, I think, as you said, we have been following the sector for a few years now. And you now I remember even from like the first year that we set up a, a, our, our office in Singapore, We've been uh, talking with certain companies in uh, in the region uh, with their own uh, streaming business models. Uh, I think it's really interesting because, uh, you know, as we all know, there's a lot of challenges in terms of uh, I, I guess setting up the right infrastructure for um, you know, for, for setting up an OTT streaming company in this region uh, in terms of being able to reach consumers and in terms of obviously being able to develop content as well. Uh, I, I think maybe one company that's uh, you know, that stood out uh, in terms of building a more creative solution 
to accessing the, the mass market. Um, it was a company, I, I guess I probably shouldn't say the name um, directly, but uh, that was basically building like uh, their own uh, infrastructure hub uh, across uh, countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, where they were working with the warums, the sorry sorries, you know, the, the neighborhood convenience stores, right. and, and essentially building mini satellite hubs um, in each of those stores. So you know, they would be able to, to, to take data from uh, via satellite and then be able to transfer it uh, through Wi-Fi to users that would be visiting these uh, convenience stores. And so that was a way for them to be able to reach users. And these are obviously not in uh, you know, Jakarta, uh, Manila, et cetera, that um, would be able to then have access to uh, the content, you know, sachet, uh, sachet style, where they could download one episode at a time, one movie at a time, obviously not having to consume their own bandwidth either. And so I, I think um, certainly a, a lot of investment in terms of CapEx and in terms of setting up the infrastructure, but uh, and we thought that was a very um, uh, creative way to, uh, to to be able to tackle some of the problems that yeah. uh, they, were, they were facing. Uh, another company that comes to mind, I, I guess, uh, is uh, is one called M17, that's in the live streaming space based in Taiwan. Mm. That's a company that uh, you know, Mohan, I'm sure you, you've followed a long time as well. I know you did from yeah. they were Pack Tour, uh, and you know, I, I I I just remember that uh, you know, we were really impressed with how they had pivoted that model from Pactor, which was a dating site you know, from what is like seven, you know, six, seven years ago to, uh, to a live streaming site uh, that was first in Taiwan and, and then eventually moved into, into Japan and uh, parts of Southeast Asia as well. Um, and the fact that they were really starting to prove that the business model that had been working in China was starting to work in other markets as well. Um, no, I saw a recent media report saying that they were doing around 50 million uh, in monthly revenue now. So uh, again, you know, it's third party report, but uh, this just kind of shows uh, this uh, you know, some, uh, some indication of the scale that they've been able to, to yeah. reach, I, I think. Uh, with the M17 example was, was a very good one, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, started with dating and then shifted to, to uh, streaming. And, and the yeah. best part, it was through an acquisition or a merger of a company that they met in Taiwan. And yep. not even something that they developed themselves. So it's true and an, an interesting opportunity that they saw that they decided to pursue uh, uh, you know, going into that space, right? Yeah. So that was a really good one, right? That you, yeah, that you yeah. brought up. I'm um, sure Joseph, uh, well, Joseph, for their CEO, will be able to write a very interesting book at some point. Hundred uh, percent. Yeah. Hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. I mean, it, it's it's amazing the amount of uh, uh, revenue they're generating as well from the reports you mentioned and also yeah. from some other areas. So it definitely goes to show that the streaming business has. Uh, a huge amount of potential uh, in this region, especially right for uh, for for Dinesh, right? Like, so you you previously were part of iFlix, uh, uh, you know, all of our content, you know, movies, TV shows, kind of streaming, and then uh, you joined uh, iQIYI International, uh, and that's actually owned by Baidu, right? It was spun off by Baidu, invested by a venture firm, and then Baidu decided to buy out all the shares and own one hundred percent of it. So when you well, was just a, just a, it's actually it's actually it actually got spun off a couple of years ago. So I think mm. Baidu still owns about fifty six percent. Uh, don't quote me on that number, but the the rest of it's actually it's a Nasdaq listed company. Got it. Okay. Uh, thanks for the clarification there. Now, in terms of your iFlix uh, experience, right? What were specific you know trends and challenges that you saw at iFlix? when it came to the users in the region or the kind of content that you guys were doing or the infrastructure related issues that, that, that existed? Yeah, sure. Uh, there, are, there are a bunch of them. So, I, so I, th I think the first one's the most obvious trend. I think like all OTTs are trying to capitalize on. There's just an increasing consumption of online video content on a mobile device. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that everyone on this call and everyone on this panel probably knows and is aware of. But you know, majority of the users who are consuming content on iPlay and, I, and for most OTTs, local OTTs and regional OTTs in the space all consume it on a mobile device. So I think that's an overarching macro trend mm -hmm. that, is, that has only accelerated over the last 12 months and definitely over the last six months. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's the most obvious, obvious one. I think the other interesting one is that uh, the funny thing with the content space is that there's so much content out there. There's an infinite amount of content out there that, that is at everyone's fingertips and every single bit of content is, trying to, is out there gunning for user attention. So I think one thing, one interesting point is that users are increasingly seeking for higher quality content. Uh, because content is so accessible, um, 
like users don't want to waste time watching content that just doesn't it doesn't make sense like if it's lower quality content if it's content that's not relevant even mm. if it's available for free uh, users will users will just choose to not watch it because they will rather spend their time. It, you know, they have limited time on their hands. Uh, if they're going to watch content, they want it, they want it to be time spent on content that actually makes sense for them. So I think one key lesson learned is the importance of actually uh, producing, selecting, and producing high quality content for a platform. I think that's super critical. Uh, mm. The other the other issue is the obvious one in Southeast Asia of just the structural complexities of the market where. Uh, you have different countries in Southeast Asia with different uh, network connectivity uh, standards. So when, when at, at, you know, back, back in my previous company, you, you know, when you think about how do you deliver that content, once you, the first problem is getting that great content. The second problem right. is how to deliver that content in a seamless way to all the users in all these markets that have uh, structural infrastructure issues, uh, such as, you know, not everyone has the best internet connectivity as say Singapore, where you're at Mohan. Uh, and we think of all these issues and how do you then moderate the quality of the content versus the bandwidth it's taking up in order to deliver that seamless experience for users. I think that's that's something that you know, at iFlix we definitely spend a lot of time on and definitely I think all all OTT players who want to enter the region in a big way have to, have to figure out and have to solve. Right. Um, the other issue that really affects not only OTT players but even traditional media players is piracy. Mm. Uh, I would say that that still, you know, despite all the challenges, I think piracy is the number one biggest challenge because it's crazy how much pirated content is out there on the internet. Uh, and, and, and it's crazy how much time is being spent on pirated content. So I'll give you a funny example. Um, you know, like there are a lot of OTT players and iFlix included, and I don't want to speak on iFlix behalf anymore, but this is just an interesting trend that I'm seeing even now at IGE where it's, you know, we run, an, we run a freemium model where we have both an AVOT and SVOT tier. So right. we, have a, we have a tier where users can actually watch free content uh, on an ad supported model. So the content is actually free. You don't, need to, you don't need to pay anything to watch it. And still, there are a lot of users who still, because that habit's so ingrained, still wanting to watch pirated content. And, and it's funny how fast these pirated links just pop up. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like we could launch a piece of content today on the free ad supported model. So it's totally available for use as free. Within a week, you would easily see about 100 pirated links pop up, either on YouTube, Facebook, Dailymotion, beyond Telegram. And, and, and people are just propagating the usage of these pirated groups. So, so I think piracy, piracy is still the biggest issue for on any OTT in the market. I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the questions tend to be around, you know, are people going to be willing to pay for content? I think, yeah. I think even ignoring the fact about whether users are wanting to pay for subscriptions, even if you have an AVOT model that's ad supported, uh, and, and as an OTT, we, we try to monetize some of our eyeballs through ads, uh, even that gets impacted by piracy where users still uh, still gravitate towards that content, even though we have it free on our platform. So I think that's yeah. still a big I issue. I would have thought like streaming would have really helped the piracy issue. But I guess fundamentally, users just want an experience without the ads, right? And they want a, right. as clean right. of an experience as possible, right? And that's unfortunately, right. just some users, you just cannot sway them that way. Uh, which is I, a, which think, is... I think it, it, it's a long battle. I think it's two-pronged. One, one is... Uh, the battle against the pirates themselves. So I think mm. we spent we spent a lot of time uh, trying to address that issue uh, internationally, uh, mm. working with all the big platforms. Like we work very closely with YouTube to take down pirated links. We work mm. closely with like governments and regulators in different countries to help battle piracy because it, it impacts not just our platform but the media industry as a whole. So I think that's one part of it, and the other part of it's obviously continuing to guarantee to the users that you know. By, by providing them the best content on a seamless experience on our platform. So it's kind of two prong. You got to, you got to take on the pirates, but you also yeah. got to be able to deliver value to the users as well. Correct, correct. You want to make sure that the users have the best possible user experiences while you also make sure your business is sustainable. Exactly. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh. So we already have some cute questions coming in from the audience. That's, that was really fast and very much appreciated. I'm going to hold off some of them for now, uh, but I'm going to jump back to uh, um, uh, Albert, right? Um, from your perspective, Albert, like from an investor perspective, since you, you're investing in early stage companies and all that, do you genuinely think it is realistic for startups to compete in this space? 
uh, or do you think it's going to be dominated by the the grabs and the and the gojeks of the region, right? And and for context, right? Uh, was it GoPay that that just raised a um, a bunch of money from uh, Golden Gate and a few other yeah. investors, ZW, yeah. ZWC or something like that. Yeah. So what what is your view on this? Is there a, is there an opportunity for startups here? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, as you said, it's uh, it's sort of a yes and no question, right? So, mm. um, do I think that startups will be able to compete with the in the established OTT space against mm. the likes of Netflix, Disney Plus, you know, IGE, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, I think that's a very difficult uh, task, right? Um, it, it obviously requires a lot of capital. Um, and I, you know, as we've seen uh, you know, increasingly, the ability to produce quality, differentiated content, the ability to acquire user, users at scale, the ability to build out that infrastructure. You know, I, I think for a host of reasons, that's, that's very challenging. Mm. Um, at the same time, I think there's still a lot of opportunities uh, either within, uh, let's say, specialized content verticals or as um, uh, maybe like an a enabler or a kind of in a supporting business model um, right. to, to, to definitely still be able to um, invest into the space. Uh, you know, in China, there's a company called Ruhan that's uh, essentially like an influencer incubator. Right? They're listed mm. now in, uh, in the U.S. as well. Um, where they, you know, they basically find and uh, identify um, and nurture promising talent that uh, then they can uh, manage um, once they, you know, reach a certain uh, kind of level of followers and right. help them, uh, you know, be able to basically do this as a career. Mm. Um, I, I think user-generated content is uh, is a very interesting area. It's one that we've been looking at for for some time now as well. Where um, you know, uh, in, in that case, uh, you know, obviously you're not directly competing with uh, a, a Netflix in, in terms of um, the type of content you're generating, or you're competing to some extent in terms of the time. But um, no, uh, you know, with um, live streaming, with short form videos, um, you know, live e-commerce to some extent. Uh, you know, I, I think um, we're finding that there is a lot of potential for Southeast Asia to follow what's happened in China, in, you know, in mm. the US and in other places in terms of building a really an ecosystem of, uh, of, of influ no, I guess, quote unquote influencers, but um, right. no, uh, individuals who, um, who are able to generate their own content, right? Who are able to generate their own follower base. And I think we've seen also that it's increasingly possible to even be able to monetize this across different media different medium and different platforms so maybe you ha you have a a hit book that you then adapt into a tv series um, or you know kind of a, a comic that's been produced that they, they then adapt into a movie um no, I, I think uh he has has done has done types like this in india uh, sorry in china before um mm -hmm. where there's a company in Thailand, called Oakby, that uh, yep. you know, that, that we've met before as well, that we think has uh, you know, has built a, pre a pretty interesting um, base of content as well from you know from their own ecosystem of uh, content producers. So you know, I, I think there's there's still a lot of ways that startups are able to um, to build interesting businesses in the space. Um, again, I, as an investor, I would be, uh, I guess, very weary about investing in a company that's directly competing with, uh, you know, again, with one of the big OTTs. But there's a lot of different ways that you can still you know, build a business that's tapping into the growth in this market. Okay, so for you, it's about being hyper-focused, hyper, in some sense, niche, uh, and to a certain extent, you, you, you like the user-generated model, right? The UGC yeah. model. I mean, as with anything, it's about building moats and being able to scale, right? And so I think if you can build a moat around the content, um, you know, you can do this either by spending a lot of money on very high quality, professionally produced content or by cultivating a, you know, for example, cultivating a, a loyal user base that right. is able to generate that content within you know, that community and that, uh, right. and that platform. Dinesh, you had a very interesting take when we were discussing this earlier. Uh, what is your view on, on this question? Yeah, I think it echoes a little bit of what Albert said. So I think it, my view is that, look, like I think there's a massive opportunity uh, for startups in the content creation space. So like at, at, at IGE, we, we are always looking for amazing content 
and we want to partner with uh, content creators and talents that, that have great ideas, uh, that want to develop uh, those ideas, uh, and either need the funding or the platform to showcase those ideas. So I, mm. so I think, so I think uh, the opportunity is actually to work hand in hand with all of the platforms that are coming to Southeast Asia. Uh, everyone's hungry for great content. Uh, mm. So I think content creators will actually uh, become increasingly important. Uh, they're already important today. I think this trend will only continue to grow. And I think if you're out there creating great content, as I mentioned earlier, then uh, there's a huge opportunity to, to, to partner uh, with a lot of the platforms out there. Mm. Okay, great. If you know, uh, great content out there, feel free to reach out. <laughs> Dinesh, since we're on your topic, right? Like, so we've got an interesting follow-up question from here. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much we can talk about this, but let's try, okay? So what is uh, uh, IGE's plans uh, very specific to Malaysia? You know, what are the interesting things that are coming up that maybe you can, you can share about or talk about? Maybe some of it is, you know, relevant to, to the content creators that you were referring to. Is there anything that you can share there? Yeah, sure. Um, I, think, I think I'll answer that question in two ways. I think I want to start at a higher level first um, as, to, as to what our kind of overall strategy is for IG International. Uh, so we want to be a pan-Asian uh, entertainment house, right? So we want, we want to have, we want to be the home of, of the best Asian content. So mm. what, is, what does that mean? So, um, I mean, you, users today, they, they want you know, uh, we had this, I, I think we kind of had, we talked, we talked a little bit earlier as well, Mohan, but like users today, they want both global content, but they also want local content, right? Yeah. Like, we, like, like you can't, I don't think you, you segment it by, oh, there's some users that only want global content and some users that want local content. I think you got to have both as a platform. Because user, there will be users that want to consume both global and local content. And, and we see that where, you know, Korean, we have Korean content on our platform that works really well. Uh, that is successful internationally. And just recently, a couple of weeks ago, we actually launched local Malay content on the iChi mm. platform that has driven a huge amount of users where we were actually the top, uh, the mo we were actually like the most downloaded app in Malaysia last week uh, nice. across all categories, uh, which just proves that, you know, there's demand for both Korean content and there's demand for local content, local Malay mm. content as well. So I think when it, so when it comes to our strategy, we really want to straddle between both uh, having international uh, content uh, that will work both locally and internationally, but we also want to want to go deep into local as well to be able to satisfy the daily needs of users in Malaysia that want to mm. local content. Mm. Uh, so, in terms of plans going forward, I think it's it does it's two prong. We will continue to always have international content. That's going to be our strategy. Just today, an announcement came out where you know we 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 now have a partnership with CJ in a big media house in Korea where we're going to have a whole bunch of movies, Korean movies, they're going to be available exclusively on the IG platform. Uh, right. Concurrently, we, will, we also want to satisfy the local content needs of, our, of users in Malaysia as well. So we will also, you will also see a whole bunch of local content initiatives uh, by us, uh, both on the licensing and production side. Okay, so more, more local is what you've mentioned quite a bit. Interestingly, there was an anonymous question asking, is more local the way to go? It was also part of my question. So you've kind of answered it, Dinesh. So can I push this to you, Albert, right? From an investor perspective, do you think companies or do you think the industry should start, you know, like hyper-localizing some of the content and focusing much more on local markets? Or do you think otherwise? What are your views on that? Yeah, I mean, actually, I, I had a bit of a follow-up question to Dinesh as well. Maybe if we could make this uh, kind of a three-way conversation here. But, yeah, um, let's do it. Uh, I, I, because I, I think it's a question that we've, um, no, but we've discussed um, internally as well. Like, you know, what is the right approach here? And, and, and again, it, I, I think there's obviously no, probably no correct answer. But, uh, you know, I think for a company like IGE, that has already this huge library of titles in China that already has a huge amount of data from what viewers like to see in China. Now, how much of that are you able to leverage and bring into, um, a, you know, into a market like Malaysia where, uh, again, obviously you need, you need to localize it, but you're, you're not going to, you don't need to start from zero, right? You're, you already have a pretty deep library that you can start from to start to seed the, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the local library for. Um, you know, for, for the region. Um, so I, I think for, I mean, for us, like, I view that as a 
um, as an advantage, right? That you don't have to build all of the content from scratch. Um, that you have a, uh, already an existing library. You can obviously leverage the the pieces that are already successful, and then you selectively add in, um, you know, local pieces where it fits gaps or you know where you find that there is increasing interest. Um, but you know, I, I, I view it as if, if we already have something that you can put into the into the platform, then you know, obviously that reduces the upfront cost that's needed to, to, to kind of get it off the ground. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think, I, think we, I think I'm fortunate in the sense that we've got a pretty strong base in China, both on the content and, and technology platform side of things. So that helps massively. Uh, although I do think there's obviously a lot of work in understanding the local market as well. Uh, and, and how do you then take that strength in your content catalog and your tech platform and then localize it to the Malaysian market, to the Singapore market, and, and also obviously to the rest of the markets in Southeast Asia? So I think the short answer is yes, uh, it, that, that it helps a lot uh, to have that platform as an advantage. Uh, I think the challenge now is how quickly can we localize that offering uh, so it meets the specific needs of each of the markets we want to target in Southeast Asia. You know, localization also has two forms, right? Like there's one version where it's 100% locally created content, right? Uh, then there's the other version where it's content that has already existed in some form overseas, like for example, The Amazing Race. And then you like localize it by adding local flavors, local uh, concepts, local ideas and some local styles to it. And then I, ideally it gets taken up by the local market in a, in a whole different way. I think that has happened with some of the game shows that's right. That's right. Uh, some of the uh, some types of content that has worked actually really, really we have well. A really, good, we have a really good example of that actually. So, uh, and this is where the whole cross cultural promotion really, really, really is uh, evident on an international platform like ours. So, give you an example. We had a really strong hit variety show called Youth with You, a mm -hmm. massive variety show of ours in China. Uh, one of the one of the judges uh, was Lisa from Blackpink. The, mm. the popular Korean uh, girl group. And Lisa is actually Thai. So you have a Thai rapper who's part of the biggest Korean girl group in the world, who is wow. a guest judge on a Chinese variety show. So that show did amazingly well on our platform. Mm. Uh, we did put up some of the some of that, of that content on YouTube. And I think it's got, since that, the entire season, we've had about 300 million views of whatever content we put on, our, on, on YouTube. Uh, to do with a variety show. So when you, right. talk, when you talk about like local, so obviously it also works really well in the Thai market as well. Like Lisa, Lisa's big, Blackpink's big across the, across the world, but obviously it resonated really well in the Thai market because all of a sudden you got one of the Thai celebrities uh, mm. who's a global icon that's also uh, played a key role in a Chinese variety IP. And, and I think, and, and that's also an opportunity that we see when we work with creators in Southeast Asia, for example, even in Malaysia, where all of a sudden, you know, we have an international platform and you as a creator, you have a, if you have an interesting story to be told uh, that you want to showcase to the world, uh, like, like we would love to work with you to help get that story on our platform as well. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, it's a great opportunity for creators, again, to then be able to tap into the Chinese market, to work together with successful Chinese IPs. So again, to Albert's point, like, if there's a cool way of localizing and adapting a successful Chinese IP into a local language or local format, that, that's, again, something that we are exploring and having conversations about. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so let's move on to the next part, uh, which is uh, something that's more relevant to our current time, uh, which is COVID-19, right? I'm going to share some stats at the end of the session on how much of an impact COVID-19 has played on the streaming industry, but the numbers are mind-boggling, right? Give you a simple high level, right? Like Netflix consumption surged like 115% in Southeast Asia. Uh, Switch, for example, grew 100% year on year in terms of hours spent. Uh, and even Disney Plus has started like massively hiring in this region, right? Do you generally think that this is because users' habits are changing towards the consumption of streaming content and services? Or do you just think this is something that's going to be here for the short term just because of COVID-19, just because people can't, have, can't go outside and all that? And post-COVID-19, right, do you think there's going to be a drop? How do you think all of this is going to change? So whoever wants to take a step at it can, can go first. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I guess I can I can start. Um, 
I, I think definitely a, there is a chunk of that um, of that growth that is going to be short lived, mm. right? and it's tied to the fact that you know if we're all in our houses all day. I mean, obviously we're not traveling and even going to the office. Then there's a lot more time that we can spend streaming, playing Switch, you know, trying services like yeah. online groceries. Um, and some of the, by definition, will just not, some of the time will by definition not be available. However, uh, you know, I, I definitely think that um, the, the baseline for where um, you know, those services are, like the baseline of the users has increased from, let's say, where we were at, at, on March 1st right, versus you know, August 6th. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that is here to stay, right? I mean, uh, no, we, I think there's been this kind of discussions in various um, platforms that COVID-19 has accelerated certain industries by years, right? Maybe even like, maybe even by a decade in terms of, uh, you know, like there's no way to replicate the, um, the surge in demand and in trial and awareness right. that certain platforms have seen you know, purely because of, you know, kind of almost like right place, right time, right model. Um, and so, yeah, I know they clearly have been beneficiaries of that and um, know that that gain will definitely not go back to zero. It, it will decrease for sure, but it will, mm. it will not be a zero. You know, it will not be zero. Mm. And so, um, no, so I, I think in a sense, it's up to the company as to how well they're able to retain um, some of the gains that they've made, right? Like we've seen um, streaming companies that we you know we have a, uh, a company in our portfolio in the U.S. called Skillshare. That's uh, right. you know, basically uh, producing videos for um, the various sorts of um, online uh, 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 online content, like you know, let's say uh, Photoshop, or um, you know, if you're learning how to uh, maybe play an instrument, and uh, you know, and, and they saw a huge surge in trials. Um, during during the lockdown period, again, you know, people at home wanting to maybe pick up a hobby, learn something that they hadn't done before. Yeah. Um, the question was always, how many use, how many of these users are they going to be able to retain after the trial period, after the, that first month trial is, is finished? Yeah. That's and, a big know, question. Yeah, yeah. If, if you, you know, if it goes up by hundred percent, but it goes back down to you know the baseline afterwards, then you, you basically just wasted a lot of bandwidth, a lot right. of server costs, and you didn't really get much out of it. Um, right, right. But I mean, I, I think fortunately for these guys, and I, I think for also uh, you know, a number of other businesses that have been in, in a similar category, they, they actually, they, they saw that the retention surpassed their expectations. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, it was actually significantly surpassed their expectations in terms of how many people not only tried it out for the first few weeks, but also you know, remained a paying user afterwards. And yeah. so I, again, it's obviously not 100% or you know, anything close to that, but it's, it's also you know, not, not you know, it, it's also not a small number either. So, yeah. um, you know, so, so I think that, you know, that, that behavior, at least for the medium term, is, is here to stay. Yeah, I know for a fact that my dad's going to be keeping his Netflix subscription post-COVID because he's already yeah. on some of the shows. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that one has so a positive change because pre-COVID, yeah. he, he wouldn't bother, right? But, but, but Dinesh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I think I probably echo a lot of things that Albert said. Uh, you know, I'm not a... Uh, I'm going to stay a bit conservative um, and say that, you know, give a very PC answer and you say, I'm not going to comment on future trends. It's hard to predict the future. <laughs> and, and it's obviously unprecedented nature of the whole virus and who knows what happens afterwards, right? But I think I think I, I would agree that, that you know, in my personal view, it did accelerate some trends, right? Uh, I think I mentioned right at the start of the first question, you know, there, were, there was, that, there was just that, that first trend of, you know, increasing consumption of online video content. I think mm. I think the whole the whole uh, lockdown situation has definitely accelerated that for everyone. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. two, I think I also mentioned that, you know, uh, users are just only going to get more selective with what content they watch. So even mm -hmm. though they might have more time on their hands and even mm -hmm. though they might be watching more, I think, you know, it comes to a point when because there's so much out there now, I think users will just continue to get more selective on mm -hmm. what kind of content they want to watch and how they want to spend their time. So I think as a, mm -hmm. As, as, as a business, like as long as you're focused on serving the user and, and, and building that catalog of premium content uh, and focus on user experience, I think you'll continue to ride that wave. Uh, I think the question is, you know, coming out of, of and who knows how long it's going to take, but coming out of the whole um, coronavirus situation, I think, I think the businesses that do end up 
uh, uh, being able to to come out positive and not just have to Albert's point like everything just goes back to zero or or, or, or you know you you retain a minimal upside after the whole effect of it is the companies that you know still focus on the fundamentals themselves right mm -hmm. uh, of what you need to do and and it's easy to get lost in it because there's so much going on right now and a lot of a lot of things that uh, that I think companies are very distracted with now but I think it just goes back to I like for us as a platform at least I can speak we are very focused on you know are we delivering are we going to continue to deliver the best content for users mm -hmm. are we are we working with the best creators and are we going to focus on the consumer experience so i think if we focus on all these things like regardless of where we end up at the other side of the of the wave or, what, or whatever you want to describe it i think hopefully we will we will come out okay nice so great content in, in a nutshell great content should trump any pretty much any situation now whatsoever you know I, i'm a bit bummed because there are a lot of very good questions coming in on like uh edutech space the education streaming and unfortunately, we don't have Kay here to join us. But there's one interesting question from here. And unfortunately, I can't thank the person for asking this because it's anonymous. But will we see industry consolidation? Like, do you think there's going to be consolidation in the region? Do you think more companies are going to merge, come together? Do you think uh, larger investment firms are going to want to uh, maybe jointly invest in multiple companies together with the, with the hopes of uh, consolidation? What do you all think of this? Dinesh, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, this is just my, I just want to caveat, this is just my personal view. <laughs> not, 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 not anything that, you know, not, not, not representing the company is just my total personal view. I think, I think yeah. the way it does make sense is that, you know, look, content like, back to the point earlier, how I said content is really important. I think, but content is also getting increasingly expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. quality, sorry, let me take that back. Quality content the quality premium content is also getting increasingly expensive because mm. users demand high quality content. Uh, platforms want more of that content to serve their users. And so there's a lot. And if you're a creator that's producing high quality content, you're going to be in demand, right? And because of that, like, uh, I don't have the stats and numbers with me, but I think the costs of content, of premium content, has be, have been rising over the last few years because fueled by this demand, right? Uh, and, and therefore, at some point, you know, as, as, a, as a streaming service, you got to think about the economics as well, right? Mm. Like at what point, you know, at, at what point does the cost become too big? So I, so I, so I think uh, as a streaming service, you're definitely looking at ways to, to obviously you want to get great content, but you still want to think about your P&L as well. So I think if there are ways where you can sort of like cost share uh, across uh, with other platforms in different ways or forms, whether it's, you know, simple, it's whether it's strategic partnerships or something more than that. Uh, yeah. I think that's something that, that, that will happen and has already happened and, and conversations are happening across the industry on that. Uh, so the, the short answer is consolidation per se, hard, hard to say, but I think uh, if there are more strategic partnerships where you know, platforms get to share, share the cost burden or get to provide greater value uh, for, their, for, their, for their separate groups of users, I think that makes sense. So does, does IGE actually have a investment arm or a venture arm actually? Do they act actively uh, look at MA? Not, not, not uh, IGE does not uh, mm. have a have a venture arm. No. So a, a lot of a lot of the stuff that we've done in, in China is invest directly in creators, and we work with production houses uh, mm. to produce that that great content. Interesting. So Albert, uh, same question to you, right? Um, do you think there's going to be a lot yeah. of industry uh, consolidation? I mean. I think ultimately, yes, although I think at the moment, to me, it still seems like it's too early for that to happen. I mean, you know, we're, we're still in the relatively early phases of even just building this market in, in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. So I, I don't know if you can really consolidate a market that hasn't really materialized fully yet. But right. I, I think um, you know, to one of the, Dinesh's earlier points um, around the, I, I guess, the cost of premium content I I would have to say I agree, and maybe one, one want to add one additional thought is that there's also a relative scarcity of that supply of premium content mm -hmm. um, because uh, especially if you're looking at uh, something let's say UGC, uh, you know there's somewhat a finite number of really good creators that are mm -hmm. in the market, or at least immediately available. You know, some can then be taught and cultivated and all that. But um, you know, in terms of like more readily, maybe let's call it naturally talented creators. Right. right. And 
Um, no, I, I think if you look at any live streaming platform, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's like out of 100 people that watch me, maybe 10 or 15 of them actually stream. And out of that, maybe five of them are actually good streamers or that have some level of followers. So again, it's a relatively narrow pyramid in terms of creators to, um, to viewers. Right. And I think because of that, uh, you know, either a lot of companies are going to need to find ways to cultivate and incubate talent quickly, or there's going to be um, a, you know, maybe a bidding war or some sort of consolidation that happens uh, just to get the access to, uh, to that premium content. Since, yeah. you know, as we've all agreed, content drives is what's driving, um, yeah. I, I guess, the user experience in a lot of cases. I mean, although this is changing, right, like, Southeast Asia also doesn't actually have that big of a, a film and TV industry. Like, if you look at the US, like, with, the, with, with Hollywood and all that, right? I mean, you look at uh, the Netflixes and the Disney Pluses and the uh, Apple Pluses of the regions of the world, right? They are starting to attract the type A celebrities, A-listers, mm -hmm. content creators. And I think it's a bit hard for this region since that group really doesn't exist that much. Except maybe China, yep. I think, to a certain yep. extent. So it will probably take some time for local talent to be developed and for the local consumers to, in fact, want to uh, watch or consume content from the local talent. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a, yep. it's kind of like not just uh, uh, a tech or a startup related problem, but also an industry and a market demand related problem. Uh, um, yeah, and I think we're still in the pretty early phases of that happening, right? So, uh, yeah. you know, let, I, I, I think it's going to happen. And, you know, I think let's, uh, we're all probably hoping that it, it will happen, but no, yeah, there's still a ways to go there. Okay, so um, I'm just going to take a bit of a left view uh, uh, question here from the audience since I have you now. Um, it's more directed towards Berda. So what is Berda actually okay. looking at investing in next? Um, specifically, like, you know, what are the opportunities that you guys are looking in? Um, sure. I, I, I guess maybe a bit beyond just the, the, yeah. the, the topic of um, beyond streaming the yes. session, but um, no, I mean, I, I think maybe to try to tie it back in a little bit. Um, definitely uh, around digital content, uh, uh, themes around digital content is an area that we are interested in. Um, I, I think you know, anything that can become a platform um, with ideally some sort of community and or commerce angle is, right. um, you know, that, that's very, I guess very, very broadly um, kind of a theme that we've been interested in for some time now. And I think, you know, what's, what's going on with the pandemic, that's really only accelerated, um, I, I guess, that interest in uh, kind of the developments in, in that sector. Right. Um, maybe more specifically, um, you know, uh, again, moving a bit beyond just the, the topic of this panel, but, uh, you know, we, we continue to look at, um, uh, you know, vertical e-commerce plays. We continue to look at fintech as an interesting vertical healthcare as, a, as, as an area that we are. Um, they're in increasingly interested as well. Um, mm. So, you know, those are, yeah, I guess some, some of those sectors that we're, we're, we're looking at a bit more closely. Okay, but, thanks uh, for that. Yeah. And I uh, hope everyone got a bit more of a more holistic understanding of uh, uh, Berda. Um, Dinesh, I'm going to take a question from the, from the audience as well. I'm really not sure if you can answer it, but let's try. Uh, it's specific to IGE's uh, plans for the Thai market. Uh, do you plan to do original content in Thailand or, or more like the Thai market? You know, is that something you can, you can talk about? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not as close to the Thai situation because I, there's, there's my counterpart in Thailand, Calvin, ah, okay. <laughs> uh, that, that kind of runs the whole Thailand business. I think he's a lot closer to that. So unfortunately we do, I, I mean, I can say at a high level, we do want, we are looking to local content. So we definitely mm -hmm. will have local Thai content. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we launched our first local Thai content just last weekend. Uh, mm. so that's not produced that's obviously like licensed but uh, in terms of plans for productions it's hard for me to comment because he's he's obviously close to that situation brilliant okay so at least we have right. some insight on the Thai side but uh, we probably need someone else to look into that now I want to talk about something that I personally uh, I personally felt was, was something that uh, up and coming uh, for a while but hasn't 100% really taken off which is VR right 
Do you guys actually think that VR will finally go mainstream in 2020? Thanks to streaming services and also thanks to what uh, uh, COVID has done. Uh, yeah, sure. I can, I can, I can start. Um, I think it's a broader like so in in so IT IT China has actually been uh on the forefront of, of pushing VR in the on online entertainment space. Uh, so we've we've actually been pushing VR on so not in Southeast Asia but back in China, mm. uh, on three fronts. You know, one is actually in starting to integrate VR elements into certain shows. Uh, two, we've actually done fully fully VR immersive content. Oh, so nice. entire content that's totally VR. Uh, and we've actually, we've actually, uh, we actually provide VR hardware as well for consumers. Mm. Uh, that's obviously optimized for viewing uh, IT content uh, in VR. So, so I'll give a few examples. So integrating VR elements into shows, we had a really interesting show format uh, last year called Fortree. So okay. it basically, it takes like it follows the journey of four kind of big celebrities uh, in China, uh, who kind of run. It's a bit of a reality show format. So these four celebrities are in charge of running a fashion boutique store uh, in Tokyo. Mm. Okay, uh, and it just shows the day to day activities of how they, you know, how they stock take what's in the shop, what they sell, what they decide to sell. So uh, it's a great example of how uh, one we incorporate a whole VR element into it where one, obviously the stars are the drivers of the show, but at the mm. same time, you're promoting a, a huge amount of streetwear brands that were being sold at the fashion store, right? Uh, which was great for like brands that wanted to get exposure to it. And where the VR bit comes in is there were parts of the show where, you know, viewers could actually have a virtual a tour of the shop itself. Interesting. Was so, that sponsored though? There were, there were definitely some, like, 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 I'm not close to the details, but I imagine yeah. there were some sponsors in there for yeah. part of it because there were brands that were being part of the, of the fashion boutique store. But Makes I think in terms, of, in terms of the incorporating the VR element in a nice, uh, unique way is you have the show where you're a bunch of stars promoting the show, uh, which obviously a big draw for the crowd. And then, and then you start to incorporate real VR elements that actually make a lot of sense because they spend all, the stars spend all the time in the show. And now you as a viewer get to immerse yourself into, okay, so this is what it's like to be in that fashion boutique store. Right, right, right. Yeah. right? So it's super immersive. Uh, the other interesting thing we've done is actually full-on VR shows itself. I think just, hmm. just last week, a couple of weeks ago, one of our VR shows called Killing a Superstar, hmm. uh, actually nominated for the Venice International Film Festival. So the show is about, uh, follows the story of, you know, a group of people in a, in, in a, in a villa and then all of a sudden there's like a homicide in the villa there's a murder in the villa right and it's fully vr and it's also one of these interactive plots as well so it's vr is interactive where you as a viewer actually get to choose which narrative you want to follow right interesting. uh which is super interesting right so i think the way we see it is that you know vr is super interesting it's already got traction from a lot of the shows mm. that we've done in china mm. and 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 using big ip and big stars uh to drive adoption of vr uh is something we're doing in a big way makes sense so, so ho hope to see a lot of that uh in this part of the world soon but you know uh in china we're, we're definitely vr is a big part of what we do yeah. albert have you seen anything from from your side or do you have any views on that yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm I'm probably a little bit more bearish on on the whole VR um, experience than than Dinesh Great. is. Uh, I, I think no, definitely there are use cases for the product. You know, as you said, you know, maybe doing a viewing into a shop or a property, or um, you know, ha having having like a immersive experience with uh, I don't know with like a movie star or something. Yeah, but. You know, I, I think it's, you know, the technology obviously has been around for some time. It's continuing to improve. You know, there, there might be some point where really it kind of breaks that fourth wall boundary and, and you really feel like you're immersed. But so far, at least I haven't really seen that enabled yet through technology. And, um, uh, and I think even this year, it's a bit telling that in like somewhere like the U.S. that now has at least been on partial lockdown for the past few months, you know, like a lot of stuff had huge surges in popularity and VR doesn't, at least to my knowledge, doesn't seem to have seen that same surge. So I, I think it's still, it's still a developing technology, right? I mean, again, maybe in 
three years time we'll look back and I'll I'll be an idiot for 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 saying this, but you know it, it seems like uh, you know it, it's still a technology that a needs to be further further created, and secondly mm-hmm. that that really needs to find that kind of that killer use case. That, yeah. um, that that's really something that can go mainstream. Yeah, it sounds like uh, 4G many years ago, uh, like everyone was talking about what's the killer use case of 4G. Mm-hmm. And now it's quite mainstream. So yeah, and, yeah. and it happened really fast, right? But so I, I'm not sure whether it's going to happen that fast for VR because there's a headset element, there's the price yeah. element, and all that. But uh, I really hope it does because I'm personally like pretty excited and pumped about it. Right? Um, okay, so I'm going to take a couple more questions. Uh, there's one that's a bit. You guys might not be the experts on this. Maybe K was a better fit, but I really think it's also something that I would love to hear your perspectives from, right? Which is uh education and learning right do you guys think it can be done fully online like what's the future like for schools universities mbas and and how how disrupted do you think that space is going to be like uh i think the education space is a is a massive uh huge opportunity especially with covid you know there was a lot of disruption there but in your views what, what do you guys think about this i think the for the for the anonymous attend uh, uh Questionnaire is very specific to college, universities, and MBAs. Uh, First, yeah, sure. I, I, again, this is, I guess, just a personal opinion, but I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I, I guess, I, I don't think it can be fully done online. Uh, I, I think already we're seeing, um, you know, students that are uh, complaining about. The fact that you know, I know they're missing out on, uh, you know, I, I guess the whole offline element of um, the the university or the MBA experience you know, in terms yeah. of building uh, social relationships, building networks. Um, I, I I think that after all of this, um, definitely schools will be more able to integrate online learning into the curriculum. Mm. But uh, I, I guess I personally don't think that. Um, it will be replaced fully by, uh, you know, by by an online only uh, model. Dinesh, uh, not to sound unoriginal, but I think I think I kind of agree a bit. So I think I think the I think and this is again a personal view because uh, we're not we're not in that space. But um, I think it ends up being a hybrid model. Like I think obviously like using using technology uh, mm. uh, as an enabler obviously helps. And I think I think you know. Not obviously, if it's specific to college and MBA, it's a little bit different. But I think using technology as an enabler to deliver education to you know parts of Southeast Asia that don't mm-hmm. have access to the infrastructure or whatever, I think it helps a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. I think I think it helps with a lot of the tracking. It helps with the content organization. It helps mm-hmm. with pulling different kinds of content together. So I think it helps. It's a strong enabler to allow to allow uh, uh, education to be delivered in a more effective way. Is mm-hmm. it going to completely replace like digital interaction? I don't think so because mm-hmm. you know I think we all agree that we we like we need to have kids or students or working professionals inter learn to interact with each other on a physical mm-hmm. basis. Uh, but can can things be made more efficient? For sure. Interesting. Interesting. If if any of you done any Coursera courses over the course of the last few months since the lockdown, or is that not not your kind of thing? Um, no, I, I've been dabbling with Duolingo, but not Duolingo. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so for you, it's more yeah. language side, Dinesh. Yeah. Funny <laughs> you mentioned Duolingo. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn Mandarin as well, given the, <laughs> given my position at IGE. So uh, I spend a lot of time Duolingo as well. But no, I haven't, okay. I haven't done any Coursera for the last few months. Interesting. Doing a so, lot of doing, doing a lot of re, uh, re, catching up on my reading, but haven't done any courses in the last few months. So, so one of my close friends. Uh, he, 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 he shared with me that he would have never done an MBA if not for Quantic. And Quantic is this like fully virtual online MBA program. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and firstly, it's obviously the cost. And secondly, obviously, it's, it's where he's based, right? Like it wouldn't make sense for him to go all the way to the US and, and everything. But thirdly, it's also the very fact that he has a family, he has a, he has a job and he can do everything in the comfort of his home at a fraction of the price and he yet still virtually connect with some of like really amazing people. Like I, I definitely will catch up with him in a few months and ask him how it's going. But it does seem like there might be some potential opportunities for some specific type of people that are okay with the virtual model, that don't have the liberty of, you know, like living on a campus and that kind of thing. But I guess yeah. you guys are also right, right? You can't 100% replace the, 
the full flesh experience. You know, I'm yeah, sure no, you're no, you. no, 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 I think you're right, right? That there's, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm sure there'll be very interesting businesses that will be coming out of this, um, you know, like a Coursera or the new, whatever the new, the next Coursera is that yeah. um, offers that educational experience with, but without the cost that's associated with, you know, having yeah. all the, the campuses, professors, et cetera. Okay, we, we have to really wrap up and there are a few more interesting questions that came in, but um, I think as a, as a takeaway for, for people here, right? Um, what would you guys recommend in terms of uh, either books or resources or videos or reports that you guys have, might have read recently or any material that you might have consumed recently for people that want to, that you think it will be helpful for them to get a better sense of the streaming industry or opportunities in the streaming space? Ideally specific to Southeast Asia. Is there anything that you guys have that you can share? This is one of the questions that came up as well. Um, yeah, sure. I guess I can start. Uh, Dinesh probably is a better place to, to answer this than I am. I, know, I think it's a good question. Um, I, no, there's no, unfortunately, I don't have like a book or a manual that I can point to, but I, I guess probably two things. One, I would suggest that the, you know, the, the person who asked the question, um, you know, try signing up for a couple of these platforms, right? If you're mm -hmm. interested in live streaming, try live streaming. If you're interested in, I don't know, like uh, user generated books, then you know, try signing up for that as a, mm -hmm. as a creator, right? Because I, I think still the best way to actually learn about the topic is, is certainly going to be trying it, right? And the first few times that you do it are probably gonna be um, not the best, but I uh, know, but you, again, you learn from that experience. I mean, even the best streamers these days, I don't they had to start from somewhere. Um, I, I think the second is, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, I think we are following what's happened in China over the past 10 years, right? So I, I think if we look at some of the more successful companies that have emerged in, again, in whatever space that you're looking at, whether it's streaming or books or content, then, um, no, then, uh, I, I think there's probably more content around um, creators in that ecosystem. Now, some of it may be in Chinese, but you know, hopefully, uh, you know, some of it might might be translated to a more international audience as well. So, so that's the only place I would, I would point to. So, learning by doing or learning by just getting onto the platforms and looking at what what is being done there. Yeah, Dinesh. Uh I think I think the learning by doing is interesting. I mean, obviously, checking out the platforms, being playing around with the features and, and stuff is is one way to do it. I think I think there are a lot of interesting. I mean, with as with everything else, in the I mean, as to your education point earlier, I think if you want to learn about a space, there's so much information online. Uh, there are a lot of like, and you can ping me later separately if you guys want. Like, there's a bunch of like media or streaming specific like blogs and. And, and websites that that you can follow if you want to dive deeper into the space. Uh, there are a couple of writers like uh, like just just ping me and I am happy to share. It's all it's all online. Like you know these are guys that are thought leaders in the space and you can read about it. Like just just how I read you know E twenty seven to get my oh. tech news. <laughs> yeah. There are also a lot of other like very media specific uh, 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 sites as well or blogs. Uh, that you can also get very media specific information from. So that's a good way to stay up to date and sort of like dive deep into the space besides some of the Great. stuff that Albert said as well. Great. So it looks like Friday night, I am not going to watch uh, Netflix. I'm going to check out uh, IGE instead. Uh, and let's see, <laughs> see, see, see what I can consume there. Okay. So actually we've just come like right to the end, just nice from a timing standpoint. Before I end off the session, I just want to share like six high level stats that I managed to dig up just in case you guys are not uh, uh, are really convinced, right, that streaming is a huge thing. So Switch grew 100% year on year. So for the same, in April last year versus April this year, there was 1.654 billion hours of content consumed versus 819 million hours of content consumed in the same period uh, in a year. Kojak spun off GoPlay and they raised $15 million from ZWC Partners and Golden Gate Ventures. So even Kojak is looking at this space. Disney Plus started hiring in this region, you know, amazingly quick considering how uh, recently Disney Plus launched. iFlix got acquired by the behemoth of uh, Chinese uh, Tencent. Online video streaming uh, regionally in Southeast Asia has skyrocketed 60% in the last three to four months. And lastly, right, Netflix consumption has surged 115% in Southeast Asia alone. So if these stats don't you know, indicate how big of a deal uh, uh, live streaming in general is going to be, 
uh, then I don't know uh, what is, right? So thanks, Dinesh and uh, Albert, for sharing all of your insights. I really appreciate uh, the two of you taking the time. Thanks, Wild Digital, for uh, inviting me to moderate this panel. And thanks to everyone, right, for the really insightful questions, for taking the time to join us uh, in the afternoon. Uh, and I believe that the videos will be sent over uh, to you guys. Uh, so today's recording uh, will be sent over. Uh, if you have not already signed up for next week's episode, uh, uh, do, do register uh, for it ASAP so that you can get the link and then be prepared for it. All right, so thanks everyone and have a good week ahead.